This week, my special guest is a former 18-year refinished technician that is absolutely in love with his trade. Was forced out at an early age due to a work-related health issue, but followed his passion, which has now landed him a position with AccuDraft Booths as content creator in industry relations. He's also the former founder and host of Booth Talk Podcast. Welcome to the Mind Wrench Podcast with your host, Rick Sellover, where minor adjustments produce major improvements in mindset, personal growth, and success. This is the place to be every Monday, where we make small improvements and take positive actions in our business and personal lives that will make a major impact in our success next level growth and quality of life. Hey, what's up everybody? Welcome to the Mind Wrench Podcast. I'm your host, Rick Silver. Thanks so much for stopping in. If you're a returning listener and haven't done so already, please take a minute and click the follow or subscribe button and then rate and review the show. When you rate and review the show, the algorithms for Apple, Spotify, Google Podcasts, iHeartRadio, Amazon Music, and all the other platforms will see that it's valuable and show it to more people that have never seen it before. And hopefully it can help them too. I would really, really, really appreciate your help sharing this word with your friends and family as well. And if you're a brand new listener, welcome. I hope you find something of value here that helps you in your personal or professional life as well. Please make sure to click the subscribe or follow button so you never miss another episode. Recently, I had the opportunity to sit down with a man whose intense passion for this refinished side of the industry can be truly felt as soon as he starts speaking. His relentless desire to help other painter technicians in whatever way he can is incredibly infectious. Jeremy Winters is currently the content creator and industry relations wizard for AccuDraft Booths. His story is fascinating, from being born and raised into an artistic family, where he was naturally drawn into the automotive refinishing world early in life, but sidelined by health concerns from his chosen profession way too early in his career. But then, a training class, a friend, and fate changed the trajectory of his life. This conversation was really good, and a little long, so I decided to break it into two episodes. Please make sure to tune back in next week for part two. But first, let's get to part one of that interview with Jeremy Winters. Welcome back, everybody, to the Mind Wrench Podcast. I'm your host, Rick Slover. Thanks so much for stopping in and spending a few minutes with me today. Uh, this week, my special guest is a former 18-year refinish technician that is absolutely in love with his trade. Uh, but he was kind of forced out uh, at an early age due to some um, work-related health concerns. Uh, but that didn't stop him. He followed his passion, and uh, which has now landed him in a position with AccuDraft Booths as content creator, and he's uh, he does the industry relations, too. I've seen him the past two years at, uh, at Seaman. If you were there, too, I'm sure you saw him. Uh, he's also the former founder and host of the Booth Talk podcast, which I'm sure a lot of you might have heard of. Uh, started back, I think, uh, several years ago and ran until about COVID. Um, but anyways, uh, really excited. This is, uh, I've been looking forward to this. Please help me in uh, welcoming Jeremy Winters to the Mind Range podcast. So, Jeremy, glad you're here. Welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, man. Glad to uh, glad to be part of it. Absolutely, absolutely. You know, we talked earlier, and uh, you know, I I've ran into you so many times over the past several <laughs> years, and uh, it's it's almost like we've had some common paths, and it's just kind of cool. And I know you're you're um, just like me. You're a refinish. You're a refinish technician at heart that got uh, derailed a couple of times, but you still, I mean, that's still your passion. Uh, can you give me a little bit, because I think all of us have a little bit of an artistic background, it seems like, and we, when we end up in, in refinishing, mm -hmm. um, can you share a little bit of your background, kind of where you started from, what kind of drove that artistic flair that uh, puts you down the path of being a painter? Sure. Uh, first and foremost, it's all my mother's fault. And to this day, I still blame her for it. That's uh, you know, and, and, and she's going to get a kick out of that whenever she hears that. Yep. Um, but no, so we had a arts and crafts business growing up. Um, if you're in the South, you'll recognize it. It's, it's, a, it's a type of painting called toll painting, T-O-L-E. Uh, kind of just an old-fashioned style with woodworking and whatnot. And my dad, that's what he did. He was a woodworker. My mom did all of the painting. Well, my older brother, he is a carbon copy of our father, uh, 
really scary genetics there. But he he takes after my dad, and he would always be out in the shop helping dad with the woodworking and stuff. Well, I enjoy painting, and I was the youngest, so I got to hang out with mom all the time. So yep. over the years, I clocked hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands of hours, sitting there with mom. And just doing nothing but painting and picking up how she would do patterns. And, you know, then, you know, child labor laws be damned. We're out there, you know, varnishing everything. And we've literally got hundreds of pieces out there. and We're varnishing, putting the shines on them. We're doing high gloss, matte finishes, stuff like that. Um, but it, it all comes from her, you know, seeing what could be created from just a blank slate. And it was just something that was fun for her that eventually turned into a business for the family that we did for gosh, 10 years, 11 years, something like that. Um, but it was, it was a lot of fun. So she kind of got me introduced into, you know, the right way to do things for the art side of stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, when, when, you know, I'd have to get the pieces prepped for, I'd have to tack everything down, uh, have the brushes ready. Uh, I would do base coating on certain parts for, her and they had to be, have a clean edge on everything they had, you know, which you have to learn to hold the brush just the right way to be able to do it. Different types of brush, different cut tips of the brush, um, ways to diff do different cornering and stuff. And just so that she would be ready so she could just do the artsy stuff. And I got to do the basic stuff. Um, That's pretty cool was, stuff to learn at a young age, too. Yeah. yeah you know? I, I was I was four years old when I started working with her. And wow. uh, I think I was I, God, I was like four and a half whenever we four and a half or five whenever we took it on the road and started doing craft shows touring around. Um, but it was it was cool sitting beside her because she had a steady hand, man. That that's why I love seeing some of these artists, you know, with an airbrush and they're getting in there doing fine detail work or the pinstripers. Yes. Uh, you guys that do pinstripe work just blow my mind because I remember watching Absolutely. mom do it and I picked up a little bit, but I never had that steady hand that she did. You know, how to turn a brush as you're making a corner, you know, using a stylus to kind of kind of make your licks coming off of it, the ball end stylus. Um, all the different right. tricks that you could do to to accent eyes, you know, the uh, highlights, shadows, all it, it was really cool to take it all in. And, and it really gave me an appreciation for art and that there's always more to an image, to an art project, something that's been airbrushed, something that's been painted than just what meets the eye. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like I'm kind of nerding out about it, but when you get into that's art okay. stuff, it's, it, you, you tend to look deeper. One of the things that I, I like talking about is whenever I first saw my first giant, uh, artwork piece, and it was by Mickey Harris. It was the old Dragon Semi. Uh, it was Carlisle All Truck Nationals back in 2003, I believe it was. Mm -hmm. If you Google it, look it up, everybody. This thing is monstrous. This entire semi, the front end, the trailer, and the more you look in it, the more little details you find. And that's the cool yeah. thing about it is that you can get as involved or as plain as you want or have stuff hidden in plain sight. Art is a skill, and it's so amazing to be able to see. But uh, yeah, we, I did it, see, uh, I, you know, I know Mickey Harris. I ran into yep. him at, at an early age. Uh, and yeah, he was just he was the king of uh, he always had a um, a crown, a, a crown royal bag with him in a bottle. Right. And he was doing <laughs> those really cool full truck murals and paintings mm -hmm. that were just super detailed. So, yeah, I along with you, uh, I love that level of, of artistic detail uh, on vehicles now. So. Anyways. And, and and to to Mickey, just throw it out there, you know, one of the nicest guys you yes. will ever meet. Um, if you if anybody has had the pleasure of meeting him, you understand exactly where we're going with that. But if you haven't, when you see him, introduce yourself. Dude is is phenomenal. He He's, is cool. he, he is good people, as we say down here. If you're looking for a competitive edge for your business or a more effective jumpstart to your personal development in 2024, I'll make your first step super simple. It is a fact that an incredible number of the most successful business owners, nearly half of the Fortune 500 companies, top-earning professional athletes, entertainers, and industry leaders like Microsoft's Bill Gates, former President Bill Clinton, Oprah Winfrey, Richard Branson, Amazon's Jeff Bezos, and Salesforce Mark Benioff all have one thing in common. They all have at least one coach, and some have several, that they work with on a consistent basis. Someone that helps guide, mentor, and support them, challenge them, help them set and achieve goals that move them forward and then hold them accountable to follow through, driving personal and professional growth. Working with a coach has many substantial benefits. Just for an example, 80% of coaching clients report improved self-esteem or self-confidence thanks to coaching. 99% of individuals and companies that hire a coach report being very satisfied and 96% would do it again. 
If deep down, you know it's time to make those improvements in your business, your personal life that you've kicked down the road year after year. If you're tired of knowing there's a better version of you waiting to shine, but unsure of how to bring that version to light. If you're tired of wanting to enjoy a more successful business, but not sure how to start. And if you don't want to go another 12 months without better results, but you don't want to go it alone, then take the first step. It's super simple. Sometimes talking to the right person can make all the difference. Go to www.rickselover.com slash contact and I'll set you up with a free consultation call with me to see if one-on-one coaching is right for you. Absolutely. Um, but no, we, we did that uh, for, gosh, 10, 11 years. Did the craft shows traveling around all the Southeast. And we stopped doing it because of my dad's, uh, my dad's health. Um, it sounds worse than what it was. He had old school hip replacements. So it just got harder for him to get around, you know, doing setup, tear down, stuff like that. Uh, plus me, my brother and myself, we were getting older, you know, getting into, you know, into high school and Jason was getting into college and stuff. So it, times had changed. It was going to fall more on my parents to do that. And dad wasn't up for it. He didn't want to do it anymore. Um, so, you know, his love of hot rodding and mom sitting beside her for all those years of painting, they, they just kind of merged And every truck show I'd go to, you know, I was, I'm a truck guy, you know, you got muscle car guys. I'm a, I'm a sport truck guy. I'm a product of the nineties and, <laughs> and, uh, you know, just, just seeing some of these paint, these paint jobs that you would see, you know, the, uh, uh, God, shades of the past up in Tennessee, you know, the, the world of wheels, stuff like that you used to travel mm-hmm. around. Um, just phenomenal. And I have so many fond memories of just, I don't, I don't even, and it sounds bad being a car guy. I didn't really even really care for a lot of the cars. It was the paint that always drew me into it. Sure. Just seeing the finish, just seeing the fit and finish, you know, just how flat is that panel? It looks like a mirror, the colors. That's, that's what drew me into it. And you, you had know, to be a painter at that point, right? Yeah. It, it just drew me into it, man. And, you know, I was like, I, I got a quote for, I think it was $2,000 to do a full color change on my old 88 Silverado that I had back in high school. Now, looking back at rose colored glasses, $2,000, yeah, I was about to get hosed, but especially for a full color change. <laughs> um, but it was one of those things of $2,000, I can learn how to do this. And literally that started everything. So it, it, it turned into an awesome career Uh one that, you know, we'll, I'm sure we'll touch on a bunch of different things on it, but you know, I'm still in it. I'm not painting every day, but I, uh, I can, I'm still involved in the industry and absolutely love it. So. Yeah. And you, uh, you, so you worked several shops, right. And you did mm-hmm. some independence. Uh, I did, you finished up, I think in uh, some dealership work. Um, but what, what kind of pushed you out, uh, to where you had to change direction? I know you were doing a couple so, different things, but I know we talked a little <laughs> bit about this, right? No, no, you're fine, man. So, yeah, I uh, I was working at a dealership, uh, and it was early in my career uh, whenever this first started happening, and I didn't know what it was. Now, let me preface this for any anybody who is under the age of 30, because they don't know a world without the internet. I'm part yes. of that last generation, born in the early 80s, of I know what the world was before the internet. You know, but all we had was just what everybody told us or what we could read, you know, in the material available. Yes. And it we didn't have everything available in the click of a fing- click of a finger, you know. And even more so, even at this time, this is back 2009. This is what, 15 years ago now. So I'm f- two, three years into my painting career. Even back then, the Internet wasn't what it is today. Right. You know, at, at that point, what Facebook had just maybe just gotten started. But everybody was on MySpace, had top top what four or five friends, whatever it was. Yeah. Um, you know that yeah that's that'll date me to some of them. Um, <laughs> but no, I uh, I started developing really bad chest pains anytime I would be priming anything, um, clear coating anything, and I didn't understand what it was. Well, being a commission based painter, if I'm not going through and you know painting cars, if I'm not turning hours. I'm not going to get paid. So right. the more hours I turn, the better off it is. Well, I'll go get it checked out at the doctor. I'll see what it is whenever something pops up, you know, whenever, whenever I have time. Well, we all know how that is. And it just, you're kicking the can down the road. Yeah. Um, lo and behold, it was, gosh, that, that happened for probably about a year off and on. And it finally hit me and it was so bad. It was, it was literally like a, like if you take your fist and put it right here on your sternum, right between your pecs, and then put the same another fist in the same spot on your spine, and then just start squeezing in, and it just gets tighter and tighter. And I could never get a deep breath. It was literally I'm just 
I, right. I, it was just these shallow breaths. And it got to the point where it was, I was curled up on the floor thinking I'm having a heart attack. Mm-hmm. Um, and I knew it was paint related, but I didn't know what exactly it was. And we made the decision right then. It's like, I got to get out of this. I have got to get out of this. Didn't know about fresh air. Didn't know about anything like that. Uh, took a, about an 18 month break from the, uh, from the industry. Uh, I like to think that things happen for a reason because in that time I, uh, I got my little sister a job at where I was working and she wound up meeting her now husband. So, uh, believe in what you want, things happen for a reason. So, uh, uh, I miss the industry. Um, I really did. And that time off, I wound up going, a buddy of mine was painting his engine bay and, or he was ready to do an, uh, paint his engine bay. He was doing a motor swap and asked if I could do it. Hadn't painted anything in a while. I was like, all right. So I got me a full face, you know, respirator, a 3M respirator. And yep. I went in and I sprayed it. I didn't have any issues, no reactions, no nothing. I was like, well, that's, that's kind of cool. <laughs> so I thought everything was good. And I wound up getting a job at one of the bigger shops here in, in town to kind of ease myself back in. And that did great for about, eh, about a month. And all of a sudden I started having them and I can, I remember exactly what I was painting. I remember the day it happened. I was painting a, the front end of a silver Sienna van and I had a bumper on one side. I had the, the van backed up and I turned from doing the front end of the van and I'm turning to go to the bumper and the same thing, just chest tightening everything. And it hit with a vengeance and it dropped me to my knees in the booth. Wow. I'm in the middle of first coat of clear. I I I un I unhook the the, uh, the gun and I crawl out you know trying not to drop the clear because you know okay you, you got to save it you got to save the money. Yeah, that's money. <laughs> I crawl I crawl into the mixing room and the other painters just looking at me and I just throw my hand up and I hand in the gun I was like go finish that go finish that yeah and I'm just sitting there and I'm I'm just sitting on a bucket trying to figure out what is going on here. Um, the next week that was a Thursday. That was a Thursday or Friday. It was right at the end. Anyways, I went to a PPG uh, training seminar, uh, uh, training uh, school, PPG school Mm -hmm. up in Atlanta. And I met Tony Larimer there. So this is 2011, 2012, something like that. Yeah. And I knew of Tony because of actually what he had been doing with Kristen Felder from Collision Hub. Nobody else knew who he was. Nobody else was interested. Well, I'm that nerd that whenever I go to class, yes, I'm the guy you all hate. I'm going to constantly be putting my hand up and asking questions. And, well, what does this do? What about this? Well, I'm starting, I, I'm having pains with this. Do you happen to know what would cause that? And Tony, you know, this is this is where he earned earned my trust is that he never tried to go for a sale uh, through the entire thing, man. He He heard of what I was saying, what I was asking, and he just answered my questions. He's like, dude, that really sounds like isocyanate poisoning. It yeah. sounds like you're getting sensitized to it. Yep. Do you know anything about fresh air, breathing air, this and that? Well, and I didn't. And he took a huge chunk of that class to educate us on proper, you know, air filtration, the the fresh air hoods, this and that. Um, got That's me in awesome. touch with somebody. Yeah, got me in touch with somebody to uh, to get a to you know to buy a hood and make sure that we had the filtration in the shop. Um, so the fact that I even have this second half of my career, I owe, or the second half of my refinishing career, I owe to Tony Larimer. You know, it's, it's, if, if I hadn't had that chance meeting with him and not and been able to ask questions right then, yeah, it was stupid. I mean, I should have gone to the doctor. I mean, absolutely. You know, but, you know what though, but... Jeremy, yeah, I will tell you this, being a painter and being in so many shops over all these years, most guys back in that time um, really had not have heard of ISO sensitivity. So nobody really yep. knew what that was unless they asked somebody that knew about that. And usually mm-hmm. the only guys that knew about that or the guys that ran training centers or, you know, the guys that are in uh, at the top of SADA or 3M or some of those places, you know, where they make equipment to, to handle that. So mm-hmm. totally understand that. And it's it's a great thing that you just happened across Tony at the time that you did. Yeah. Because you might have gone another six months or had another episode, right? Or I would have been that guy or that just fell died. out in the middle of the shop and yeah. I just wouldn't be here. Yeah. And, I had some friends that have gone through that stuff. So it's, it's nothing to play with. So yeah, I mean, we, we've all heard stories. It. We've all heard stories about, you know, people who just dropped because of yeah. that. And, and it's, it's no fun and it's scary. You know, I, I, the, the comment of, you know, you don't see very many old painters. And at that point, you know, I started kind of thinking like what I need to do something 
to to have something to fall back on. Yeah. And that's that's eventually what uh what wound up happening. But all these years later, um I'm working at a I finished um I finished my my tenure as a painter at a at an independent shop here in town. And I was at God, I was walking through the shop and somebody was open air priming something. And same thing. It just it hit. Mm-hmm. And it was at that point I'm like, okay. I, I at that point I'm already in school. I'm trying to, you know, get everything finished up on a degree. And I was like, I, when something comes up, I need to start looking at, you know, possibly getting out of this. I'm, I'm hitting my limit already. Yeah. So the the fresh air stuff, it extended my career uh, of being a full time in the booth painter. And I am so thankful for it because I had an awesome career. I got it, it, it's it's led me to other awesome opportunities and I wouldn't trade it for anything. You know, I haven't had a reaction to to paint or clear coat anything like that in the two and a half years that I've been out. So that to me solidifies that that's what it is. And yeah. I can be as involved in the industry as I want now. And I just preach to everybody, you know, you only get one set of lungs, take care of them, oh, you know, God. make sure you got your fresh air, make sure that you got your filters and change your, your air filter, stay on top of them, man. Sure. But yeah, fresh these, air is the way yeah, to go. These, and these young painters today have a much better grasp of how to protect themselves, which is great to see. And PP, P, uh, PPE is, yes. is more prevalent than it was. I, you know, I grew up, I started painting in the late seventies. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, I, at that time, other painters would wrap towels around their face, you know, to spray the lacquer or the enamel and figure, well, that's yep. catching everything. Right. Or two, two, three M uh, dust masks together was the same thing as a respirator. Well, what about the cigarette, man? Yeah. <laughs> So, but anyways, it's, those it's, guys. It's, it's a good thing you caught it when you did. So, how did you, how did you end up in AccuDraft? Did Tony have another place, uh, uh, or did, was he a part of moving you towards uh, working for an equipment company, or how did that work? No, no. Um, Tony was was one of two people that was instrumental in supporting me outside of my family uh, for getting going back going back to school and getting a degree just so I have something to fall back on. Mm-hmm. Um, and in the grand scheme of things, getting a degree isn't the fact of, you know, hey, you went to school, you got this. It's showing a potential employer that, hey, I showed up for four or five years straight. I did the work that was supposed to, that was required of me. And I've got this piece, this piece of paper saying that, hey, I did that. And I was never a school guy, you know, but it was one of those things of we found out my daughter was coming, you know, we were pregnant with her and I had to do something. Yeah. Um, but, but Tony and Kevin Tetz or Kevin Tates, uh, yeah. both of those guys were instrumental when I was frustrated and hated school. Why am I doing this? Uh, and, and keeping me moving forward. Um, they, they believed in me and it, it still to this day, it's, I can never thank them enough for that. Um, but getting with AccuDraft, it, Everything happens by chance and and it's all an opportunity. So uh, I was working at a dealership. Um, it was right before the independent shop that I ended my career at. Mm-hmm. And we had two AccuDraft booths. God, the, the shop had just been built. I think it was just over a year old, maybe a year and a half old whenever I went there. Um, full AC shop, uh, two AccuDraft Titans, uh, a mixing room in between, and then had two prep decks. One single prep deck, a mixing room, and then a double prep deck beside it. Awesome setup. Nice. Yeah. Um, nice setup. Yeah. And when I got there, the previous painter that was there before had messed with some stuff and, you know, they, they, they hadn't been serviced and the stuff had gotten out of whack. You know, you start messing with stuff and you don't know what you're doing, but Hey, I know what I'm doing. I've been doing this 30 years. One of those guys and yeah. it, it got all out of whack. So they sent a guy, um, they had gotten in touch with AccuDraft and sent JB Haydell down there. And me and him, we had just struck up this conversation. I had logs of uh, all of my filter changes, the hours that it was done, you know, this and that, because I learned years ago, keep records of that because you never know when you're going to need it. And so I'm talking to him and I handed these and he just looks at me like, you actually have records of when you change filters? Like you you actually have them? I said, well, yeah. Yeah, Kind of freak you. (laughs) <laughs> well, yeah, because, oh, well, I changed them two weeks ago and it was really a month or I just changed yeah. them, you know, 40, 40 hours ago and it's been three weeks, you know, and it's, it's complete, it's complete being on this side of it. Now I see all yeah. of these things and, but we just struck up this friendship and it came out, you know, Hey, I'm used to care, keeping records of everything. You know, I'm going to the school. So I try to keep up with every little thing. I've got too much going on. And, uh, you know, just one last thing I've got to do. And he found out that, you know, through the conversation that I had to get out. 
and I was making plans to get out of painting, but I never wanted to leave the industry. I've got too much time vested in this. I love this industry. Right. And, you know, and, and I was doing booth talk at the time and at a full-time school. And now I got a daughter and, you know, my wife and, you know, this is before you know, our son was born. So mm-hmm. I've got all these things going. And JB just stayed in contact with me through the years. And we're in the middle of the wonderful, wonderful, prosperous year that was 2020. Oh, and, uh, <laughs> and yeah, sarcasm here. That, yeah. yeah just, I mean, so Preamble. freaking amazing year that will never, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but no, he just, I, I graduated in December of 2020 and you guys can't see on the radio here, but I'm doing air quotes because that is a rant from Jeremy for another time. Yes. Um, for, we'll do, a, we'll do yeah. a phase two. We'll do a part two. Oh, that's, you, you want to hear Jeremy get, go <laughs> off on something. Let, let's talk about that graduation in the middle of COVID. Uh, um, but yeah, I had a, it was the pre, it was the following, gosh, probably April. So April of 21 and JB just calls me and he says, Hey man, I got a question for you. You graduated, didn't you? Yeah, if you call it a graduation, yeah, I, I graduated. <clears throat> ah, cool. So you you still painting? You still looking at getting out? I'm always looking at you know, getting out, but you know nobody's hiring right now. JP, I'm not, I'm not too right. worried about it. You know, steady job. I'm I'm painting cars. You know, paying off student loans. You know, just just the world is un, unsteady right now. So he goes, oh, okay. So something came up. You'd you'd be interested. You you would tell you, JB, what's going on, man? <laughs> You'd be straight, will you, brother? Yeah, I was like, what, what, what are you getting at? And he goes, all right, well, we got something coming up, and uh, I think you'd be a good fit for it. So, uh, hey, sorry, not sorry. I went ahead and passed your name and number along to my boss. I said, so you're going you're gonna to be getting a call from a guy named Guido here uh, here shortly. Just just take the call. A guy named Guido oh. is going to be giving me a call. You pass my information along. He goes, dude, I, it's, it's right setup. up your alley. Yeah, he's like, it's right up your alley. I, I think you'll be good for it. Just, yeah. just talk to him. Okay. Sure enough. Guido calls and we talk and we hit it off. I'm like, okay. Next thing I know, I'm on a plane up to uh up to Jersey. And being the typical blue collar guy, I you, when you're in the shops and you're changing jobs to a different shop, sometimes you're promised the moon. We've everybody who's sure. been listening is listening right now. You understand. You you have been promised the moon and been let down so very hard. Yeah. And so so I was like I'm going to book my own flight. I'm going to go up to Jersey. I'm going to rent my own car. This way, nobody can say anything on this interview of, hey, well, I I flew you up here and you're going to shoot me down. You know, no, no, you're not having that. And, and Guido will will second this. He'll tell you because he never had somebody interview and actually pay for their own flight to come up. <laughs> and uh, so we we talked in person and we literally talked like we had known each other for a number of years. And I've only had that vibe off of, off of like maybe two or three other people in my life. Yeah. And it was, it was, okay, this is cool. And then the more I started thinking about it, the dumb painter comes in. He's like, well, now everything's lining up. This has got to be bad. No, 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 no. This has got to be bad. Well, I I wound up, um, Guido got busy and didn't call me back whenever he said he was going to. And uh, so I'm, I'm not one to be a pester. Hey, somebody says they're going to call me. I'll, I'll do it. And right. uh, it had been like two, three more weeks after that. So I just called JB. I'm like, hey, man, obviously y'all got somebody else for the uh, for the position. You know, I appreciate the offer, but, you know, I'm I'm going to email Guido. Just tell him thanks. No, thanks. No, 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 no. He hasn't made a decision. I promise you. He said, I, hang by your phone. <laughs> Literally, it was almost like I hung up. Not five seconds later, it seems he called Guido was calling me. Oh, no, and no. Uh, and yeah, absolutely. You know, I'd, I'd love to. And and uh, yeah, we struck a deal right then. And and. They brought me on board and I do content and marketing with them, a uh, little bit of industry relations, but my, my official title is, uh, is content. Uh, I handle tech articles for them, uh, write-ups and stuff. You know, uh, if you're messaging through social media, 99% of the times you're going to be talking with me. Mm-hmm. Um, I try to, I try to be that source for people that's out in the field. Of if they're, if you're a painter working late and your booth shuts off in the middle of it, yeah, I've had it happen. Yeah. You know, it's after hours, you know, you may be done with that job until morning, you know, you're working late for a reason. Hell I was. So I, I try to be that source for somebody. If somebody's got an issue, you know, heck they can message us and at least have somebody there to help troubleshoot, help them, help them, help them walk through something if I, if possible. So uh, it's, it's been a great place to be at, you know, you get the whole thing of treated like family and whatnot. Um, it, this one really has been, it's, it's been really cool to work with people who all have the same goals in mind and let you do your job. 
And not, not everything is micromanaged. So everybody's got the goal. Hey, we're going after this. You're going after this. If you need something, give us a holler in between and we'll get it going. Sweet. That's, that's and you, awesome. can just, you can just get stuff moving and then send stuff in for approval. Hey, just change the wording of this part and change this a little bit. Okay, cool. And we roll on with it. It's It's been really nice. Well, I hope you enjoyed part one of my interview with Jeremy Winters from AccuDraft Booths. As you could probably tell from the conversation, Jeremy has an incredible passion for the refinish side of this business and loves to share his knowledge. And is the kind of person, honestly, you could just talk to for hours. But there's much more to this story. Please be sure to come back next week to tune in to part two for the rest of our conversation. Thanks again for tuning in. I really appreciate your support, and I hope you have a great week. I can always be reached at www com, where you can find all my social media links, podcast episodes, blog posts, and much more. Yeah.